Anyone looking to dine or work in a New York City restaurant is now required to show proof of vaccination against the coronavirus, prompting outrage from some customers and restaurant owners who feel the new mandate infringes on their civil liberties and inhibits their ability to make a living. Welcome to the Staten Island Advances from the Scene, a podcast bringing you an inside look at the biggest stories on Staten Island with the reporters who cover them. I'm your host, Eric Bascom, and this week I'm joined by Staten Island Advance food editor Pamela Silvestri to discuss how New York City's vaccine mandates are impacting the local dining scene on Staten Island. Thanks for joining me today, Pam. It's been an extremely busy past few months on the restaurant beat. How are you holding up? I'm holding up great. I just don't like when my beat crosses into politics, I have to say, so... Yeah. And, you know, it's funny because in the past year or year and a half, really, I think that everyone's beats have kind of crossed into politics. Right. Which is something that I'm with you on. I cover transportation here for those of you who don't know. And I like to stay out of the politics stuff as much as possible. Leave that to our political team. But uh, sometimes these worlds kind of cross together and we find ourselves in uh, these situations. So I know it's not your favorite topic, but we'll be talking lots of restaurant and I guess a little bit of politics today too but um thank you again for coming on thank you for having me yeah of course so like i said i brought you on the podcast because you've been doing some really great boots on the ground reporting for us about how new york city's new vaccine mandates are affecting local restaurants from both the workers and the customers perspective so in early august mary de blasio announced that all new yorkers would need to provide proof of vaccination in order to participate in a host of indoor activities which includes indoor dining And also all workers within these settings would also need to be vaccinated. What we have put in place related to indoor dining, indoor entertainment, indoor fitness is the shape of things to come. You're going to see more and more companies do the same thing. You're going to see more cities, more counties, more states do the same thing because it's time. Bill de Blasio is the mayor of New York City. This needs to be done all over this country to stop the Delta variant. So what was the initial reaction you were hearing from restaurant owners when this policy was first announced? Well, it wasn't met with much fanfare, I'll tell you that. What was interesting was the what they did with the data prior to this. And I just want to frame this conversation with some of the things that are going on right now in the restaurant business, one of which is the restaurant owners are grappling with, you know, an uh, increase in minimum wage. That happened before COVID, but uh, there's also a labor shortage right now. Um, there's a major reshuffling of the food chain, which is causing major price fluctuations, especially with beef. Restaurants uh, like the new Navy Pier at Irby in Stapleton don't eat, they don't even carry beef or like high end cuts of beef anymore because of that, the price situation with beef. But also, you know, generally, if you ask a restaurant owner right now, everything is very overwhelming. So to add one more thing like vaccine, you know, vaccination card check, I mean, it's just, it's like one more thing on top of another. But I also want to address what they did with the data prior to this. There was a need for data collection uh, when they reopened indoor dining back in February of 2021. And restaurant owners were asked to kind of take information from people, some really personal information in order to do contact tracing. And when I asked the health department what they did with that information and the mayor's office, what they did with that information, again, crossing into politics, Hmm. basically said they, you know, didn't have any comment. So that's, that's an issue. You know, um, if if we're going to go through all these links, is it really getting us toward higher numbers? Is it, is it worth all of the effort? But in the meantime, you see what happened at Carmine's restaurant where it got very testy with people asking for the vaccination cards um, and it just escalated into something that was a big mess. So that's where we are. Yeah. And I I think that's something that we'll probably touch on again a little bit later in this. But I I know one thing that a lot of people are feeling is that these new restrictions on, on indoor dining are kind of placing an unfair burden on these restaurants, right, to make them act as contact tracers or make them act as vaccine checkers or whatever it is. I mean, if you're a hostess at a restaurant, all of a sudden you have all of these new items in your job description that are, you know, something that people don't want to deal with, whether it's the the worker or the customer. The worker doesn't want to have to ask those uncomfortable questions. And a lot of the customers don't want to answer them, to be frank. So uh, I definitely think that that has been a kind of a major factor here. But let's move back for now onto the, the new mandate. So I think some people were a little confused when the announcement 
announcement was first made, right? Because they said that the vaccine mandate for indoor dining would begin on August 17th, but then that the city wouldn't start enforcing it until September 13th. So it kind of left like this grace period in there that was a little weird for some people. In your experience talking to the restaurant owners, did did most of them start asking for the proof of vaccination in mid-August or did they wait until that September deadline or or what was kind of the, the feeling around that? That's such a great question uh, because a lot of restaurant owners tried to do it uh, on the 17th when that was first that that Monday. I was in uh, the King's Arms restaurant actually when they started that and was there for the very first customer walking through the door. You know, a couple of people abided by the the request of a leaky, you know, and whoever the waitress is standing at the front. But basically, the King's Arms, as an example, is in West Brighton. They have an outdoor section and they have an indoor section. So if the people provided their cards, they could eat indoors. If they didn't, they had to eat outside. But for the most part, say about 10% of the people that came in said things like stupid or this is ridiculous or, you know, they took it out on the owner of the restaurant. But King's Arms was one of the few places that was very, very uh, vigilant about that from the very beginning. Sally Southern was another one in West Brighton. But, you know, then you had other people like uh, in, also in West Brighton, you had Beans and Leaves restaurant with the owner, Megan Coppola, who started to do it and then was met with such blowback from pregnant women, from people who hadn't gotten the vaccination. She was really taken aback. And more than anything, she was taken aback for her staff because they were feeling persecuted and and abused. So she immediately, by so that was on Monday that the law went into effect. By Wednesday, she had written on her Facebook page and, you know, in social media that uh, why she wasn't going to be checking the cards. And what she did was she posted a sign that said, by coming in and dining in, I'm assuming that you've taken charge of being vaccinated and I'm not going to ask for your vaccination card. So that was one way that she mediated it. Yeah, it it was definitely, like you said, kind of a tough position that these people were put in because the city said that you needed the vaccine, but they weren't going to enforce it yet. So people didn't know whether or not they really needed to abide by it. I think a lot of people were just assuming, oh, I can still go up until September 13th because the city's not checking. So the restaurants won't be checking. But then you might get to one restaurant and they are checking. You might go to another one and they're not. So I I think that month gray period where I, I understand, I guess, what the city was doing to try and give people some time to adjust. But I think it ultimately just just led to more confusion than anything in, in some cases and, and just a lack of consistency across the board. But n- now that the enforcement I- is in effect, let, let's talk about that a little bit. We're about two weeks into that. And I'm curious, kind of how exactly is the city enforcing this policy? And what do the penalties look like? Okay, so for every person found without a vaccination card, whether that be customer uh, or staff, it's a thousand dollar fine. So right there, that's going to you know scare people straight into wanting to abide by the law. So we have to render to Caesar what is Caesar's, right? And I think that's generally the sentiment of people across Staten Island, whether restaurant owners are posting signs in their windows saying that, you know, we accept people regardless of race, color, creed, vaccination status, whether or not they are putting those posters up in their window or not, for the most part, they're abiding by it. And uh, what's interesting is hearing restaurant owners talk about people coming into the restaurant who they've never seen before, who they immediately suspect are inspectors who are going undercover, there have been rumors on, you know, people who come to the bar and maybe they have just like a soup and, and like a tea, you know, in a, in a restaurant that's like an upscale restaurant, like who drinks tea at the bar in the middle of the day. Right? So things like that, you know, there it, it's it's unfortunately, you know, the idea of being uh, this, this stealth investigation on, on on checking has created an enormous amount of fear. And, and as a result, a lot of anger, uh, regardless of what your political calivity is on Staten Island, I'd say 99.9% of the restaurant owners that I've spoken with completely disagree with having to be that person at the front door uh, doing that and also having any kind of you know retribution with fines. So they just really resent that on top of everything else. Yeah, absolutely. And, and like you mentioned, I think that this is a topic, at least in my conversations with people around the borough, that regardless of your political affiliation or beliefs, that I think there are a lot of people who are supportive of vaccines, and I think there are a lot of people who are opposed to vaccines. And I also think that even a lot of the people that are supportive of the vaccines are not necessarily supportive of the mandates, specifically in these cases when it has to deal with indoor dining and kind of things that you had come to thought of as, you know, everyday life, things that, you know, you were just used to. So uh, I I think that's definitely an, an interesting point that you touch on there. But so now that the enforcement is in effect, would you say that all the restaurants on Staten Island are complying with it or or the majority of them? 
Do you know any that have decided, even with enforcement, we're still not going to check proof of vaccination? Anyone who, who may have actually been fined already? Nobody's gotten fines that I know of. They generally, from what I, from the people that have gotten inspectors that have come in, they've been kind of gentle with them, not necessarily wanting to really punish the restaurant, just make, making sure that they're complying, especially with staff. I mean, this is a, another issue, but um, Staten Island restaurants, I have to say, were excellent on on getting their staffs vaccinated. You know, Chris Lacey at Lacey's Bridge Tavern was among the restaurant owners that uh, made it a point to get their staffs vaccinated because if you are sick, you can't come to work, right? So, and you know, the whole issue with work shortages, work, worker shortages was huge. So this was also a way of in, ensuring that people are coming to work and they're healthy and things like that. So it's not necessarily an issue with staff more so than it is with the customers. But in the meantime, it's a divisive issue in an, an already divisive environment. And in the restaurant business, when you're serving drinks and you're serving food, it, you know, it, there's just no room or time to get into it with, with conversations about politics and things like that. You know, I mean, their faces to feed. It's not getting into the nitty gritty of, of the way people think and such. And that's unfortunately crept into every single conversation that we're having here, uh, especially whether or not to check vaccines at the door, uh, vaccination cards at the door. Yeah, absolutely. And I know that, you know, some restaurant owners, when this was first announced, were very opposed to the mandate. They kind of banded together and, and launched this lawsuit against the city opposing these new rules. Can you talk to us a little bit about that group and, and kind of where we're at with that lawsuit? Sure. Well, the IWAR group, which is the independent uh, restaurant organization that champions for freedom of no dining restrictions and things like that, that started in May of 2020 as dining restrictions dragged on and on. And so when dining restrictions were lifted in September, that's around the time that they launched their first lawsuit, which they've repeatedly gotten uh, tossed out. But interestingly, there's a couple of them that are still alive. One, uh, they started uh, a federal lawsuit as a group. So that's progressing and they've got attorney meetings and things like that going on. But in the meantime, other lawsuits are kicking around. Uh, Letitia Romero filed a lawsuit in Manhattan, I believe it was. And that was that the federal one is still going on. So we'll see. But they've uh, basically abandoned the idea of rallying and they're just going the legal route at this point, just to be very aggressive and very pointed in making sure that they don't have to follow these mandates. Yeah. And we are, like we mentioned at the top, seeing this across all industries, all sectors, all beats of reporting, however you want to phrase it. But this has really crept into to every facet of life on Staten Island. So it, it is really interesting to see kind of where these things go and, and what precedents are set by earlier cases, how that could impact future cases. And just it's all still up in the air right now, as you mentioned. But uh, I wanted to touch a little bit. Obviously, you've spent a lot of time talking to restaurant owners about these new mandates, but you've also spent a lot of time talking to the customers about these new rules, right? So I'm sure that it's been a somewhat split opinion, right? Some favor the vaccine requirements because they think it's keeping being everyone safe. Others are opposed to it because they feel it's infringing on their rights. But, you know, can you just share some of what you've heard from these Staten Islanders when you're just out and about at the restaurants? Oh, great question. It's very difficult to find a customer who supports the restaurants checking the vaccination cards at the door. It's very hard. But I did find one. I found a doctor, actually, a physician who's a nephrologist, which is a kidney doctor. And he very much is in favor of the vaccinations and uh, the idea of herd immunity. So he was eating at the King's Arms Diner, to mention them. And he was very pleased to see that this was in effect because he thinks that every effort to get everybody vaccinated is a, is, is a great effort. So... Yes, you have a good, you know, I'd, I'd say as divided as people are in politics and, and vaccine, vaccine card checks, I think that ultimately people want to see COVID go away. So there's, you know, that that little lingering idea that if we do this, maybe that there's, you know, a reward in the end. So to keep it on a positive note, the majority of customers, you know, who are vaccinated kind of don't care because they have that pass to get in. But there's that percentage of people, especially people who are not vaccinated, that feel that they're ostracized. Yeah, and, and that's got to be frustrating for them, right? Especially there's people who may be unvaccinated and other members of their family are vaccinated and now they can't go out to dinner with them or they have to go over to Jersey to, to get dinner, which is a whole nother issue that people have been discussing about how some of these mandates are actually driving business out of New York and, and you know, pushing it either upstate or, or to Jersey or, you know, to neighboring places where it's not as restrictive. So it, it definitely has been 
a, a frustrating situation, I think, from the customer's perspective for, for the majority of people. But as we mentioned earlier, the, the requirement not only applies to the customers, but also to all the employees in the restaurants. And I know that when this was first announced, we were hearing a lot of concerns that thousands of New Yorkers could be put out of work because they don't want to get the vaccine. So what have you been hearing generally from a staffing perspective? And, and have any of these restaurants really been forced to you know, lay off employees because they refuse to go get the vaccine? Well, there have been uh, rumors of employers hiring people that aren't vaccinated because they don't want to be fined. I did find a restaurant owner who had to send uh, letters from her attorney to a few staffers who refused to get vaccinated and ultimately laid them off. And that did not go over well. And the people, including the parents, bombarded the business with, you know, really ugly emails and, and threatened to boycott. So it's not going over well in that respect. However, I would say based on my own observations is that the majority of staffs are vaccinated. And a lot of that becomes from early efforts by local groups like Project Hospitality and the hospitals to get, you know, people in various ethnic communities vaccinated, you know, Sri Lankan community, Mexican community, Hispanics. So it, it was a, a very big effort early on in March. And uh, that seems to have paid off. Yeah. And, and it's good to hear that, like you said, the majority of people in these settings are getting vaccinated, are, you know, abiding by the rules. But it, it, it is tough to think about those situations where people, for whatever reason, are not comfortable getting vaccinated and as a result end up losing their employment and creates kind of this rift sometimes between business owners and, and their employees. And it could hurt morale if it's all of a sudden the person that you've been working with in the kitchen for five years all of a sudden isn't there. And now, you know, chemistry is off. And, and you mentioned earlier, the restaurants are, you know, a very busy place most of the time. It's things moving at 100 miles an hour. And so even little things like that, just changes to staffing, it can can have a huge impact on them. So that has definitely been tough. And speaking of things that have been tough. It's really been tough for restaurants for the past year and a half, right? Between uh, originally when the pandemic first happened, there was no indoor dining whatsoever. Everything was takeout. And then they said, okay, you could do outdoor dining, but there's still no indoor dining. And then you could do indoor dining, but you could only have this percent of people. And so there was issues. Am I even going to make money? Is it worth it for me to open if I can only have this many people? There was all of these issues, right? And so I imagine that these new mandates are, are making things even harder during what's already been a very difficult year. So what have you heard from owners about how this is kind of affecting their ability to financially recover, right? Because it's been such a tough year plus for them. Mm -hmm. Again, another great question because you have the vaxxers and the anti-vaxxers on this particular vaccine. And so you have, uh, when it comes to special occasions, communions and other parties that are you know, going to be happening indoors, you have the hostess and the host faced with the situation of asking their family members, uh, are you vaccinated or not? And you know how th it brings up a whole host of issues. So as a result, a lot of parties have been canceled. I had uh, several conversations with restaurant owners uh, in the last few days specifically that do a lot of parties. And they say that business is off anywhere from 40% to 60%. In terms of indoor dining, restaurants that don't have any outdoor dining setups, they are reporting large drops in revenue compared to prior the vaccination checks. So it's it's got an impact, you know, it really put a dent in people's pockets. And of course, as you say, it's it comes after a very difficult uh, year where there was no indoor dining and juggling and trying to change formats from sit down dining to takeout only it's a blue restaurant that com they have three restaurants to manage as well as an entire staff. And they never laid anybody off and everybody had to switch gears and they were doing it to go format. And they also sold cold cuts like they turned into a deli from blue. So, I mean, like, you know, you have people completely working out of their wheelhouse and, and trying to survive and and the employers desperately not wanting to lay off staff. So on top of that, now we have people fighting the owners and, you know, canceling parties and that's hitting them in their pocket. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, in addition to keeping our readers uh, and listeners informed on all these big stories, we also like to use these podcasts as an opportunity for our audience to learn a little bit more about our reporters at the Staten Island Advance. So like everyone over the past two years or so, how you do your job on a day-to-day -day basis has had to change pretty drastically, considering we weren't really able to go anywhere for a year, pretty much. So can you talk to us a little bit first about you know how you got started with food reporting and then what your job was like prior to the pandemic and how it's kind of shifted or changed since then? 
Wow. Um, well, uh, I got my job at the Staten Island Advance after I sold my restaurant, which, you know, our lives were changing. My husband and I wanted to have a family and the restaurant business didn't quite fit into that anymore. So that's why I started working at the Advance. So I took my knowledge of food and wrote about it as the food critic and uh, as the food editor. Um, and in the meantime, during COVID, the restaurant experience really helped enormously because on March 15th, when the announcement came that indoor dining was going to close, like I remember coming back from a meeting that was supposed to be life changing and COVID changing uh, that um, a local artist had uh, kind of taken charge of. And at that meeting where this guy knew nothing about restaurants, he was kind of coming up and becoming a leader. And I thought to myself, oh my goodness, this is somebody who knows nothing about the restaurant business. They don't know anything about a grease trap. They don't know anything about <laughs> food distribution. They know nothing. And that's when my life kind of like, like a light bulb went off. And I thought, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to figure out what's going on in these restaurants and I'm going to have to report from my kitchen table, um, which is where I am now. And I started a Facebook Live on March 16th. I did it every single day for over a year at 9 a.m. It got me out of bed at five o'clock in the morning. It had me working pretty much around the clock because the Fulton Fish Market and the you know produce market at Hunts Point are you know 24 hours a day and they work they operate mostly in the middle of the night. And so I had an idea of what was happening with the supply and the supply chain from March 15th. That night I called uh, my friends at the Fulton Fish Market and I called them and they were stunned because all of their orders were canceled by 10 p.m. on March 15th. So that meant overnight, all that fish was there. Over the course of the week, I heard about how the produce was basically rotting and all that stuff was basically, you know, people had the idea of let's redistribute this and it went to food pantries. And anyway, so I've been, uh, my job has, I think as you can empathize with this, that our roles are somewhat as uh, psychologists and, uh, you know, people tend to spill their guts when they're really, you know, emotional and whatnot. So I did serve as a, a psychotherapist uh, for a good part of this pandemic, listening to the pleas of restaurant owners to, you know, get things righted and to get a leader in all of this. That was a really big problem, uh, especially in the food industry. So I think that's where the Staten Island Advance actually did a great job with our colleagues reporting not only on what was going on in statewide, but I think we did a very good job as a newsroom kind of covering everything from every aspect. It was really a 24 hour uh, situation. And I want to say one more thing. The My column that I did, I started this on uh, March 26th. It was called uh, Pamela's Food Service Diary. Actually, uh, my editor actually named it that. And I thought, you know, I can just report like in war, you know, a war correspondent, I can report on what's happening, like restaurants opening, closing. I couldn't even keep up with it. It was just mind boggling. But at least they could talk. And so we picked different topics every day and we talked. And I did this seven days a week, even on Memorial Day weekend, everything, Christmas, everything. And, um, you know, sometimes I ran out of ideas of what to talk about. So I ended up talking about my children uh, and what they were doing, and uh, which was awesome and funny. Sometimes it was really good because now I have a little record of what they were doing at the time as they were, you know, 10, 11 years old. But the downside of all of that, and I'll leave you with this, is that when they went back to school and they, they were back in the general population of children, some of the things that they did, which are kind of silly and sweet, were made fun of by their classmates. So I won't do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, that's uh, that's the age of social media for you, right? Everybody sees everything. But I, I think you made a really great point earlier. And I think that part of why you're able to do such a great job for us is your prior experience in the restaurant industry, right? Having owned a restaurant in the past. And not only do you have such a knowledge of, of what's going on and what people need to be looking out for, but you also have all of these connections and you know all of these people from around the, the island and around the city who are really plugged in and they, they trust you, right? Because they know that you're someone who has been through what they've been through, obviously not in the midst of a pandemic, but you, you know the, the industry and what it's like to have to run a restaurant and the hard decisions that they have to make and you know how difficult all that can be. So I, I think that that has really, really served you well and served the advance well because we've been able to get all of this really, really amazing food reporting from you over the past you know two years throughout this pandemic. So and so to kind of wrap things up, we're now at the point with fall and winter weather right around the corner. And a lot of these restaurants are likely going to need to either close or limit, I would imagine, their outdoor dining. So with that and then the vaccine mandates for indoor dining, how do you expect that to affect their abilities to stay financially viable in, in the upcoming months? We have a year of practice in winter of closed dining rooms and street dining and, and dealing with snowstorms and windstorms. So I think, and I tend to 
look at things more optimistically. But as difficult as last year seemed to be, I think that was just a practice run for this year. So, you know, I do see festivals returning. I do see a lot of more confidence in the customer coming out and showing up at these events. So regardless of vaccination card checks or not, people want to dine out. They're always going to buy a meal, you know, from a street vendor or whatever. And so I I do see things going forward in a more positive way. And I think winter is going to be a good one. I think that a lot more customers are more comfortable with the you know windows being open and it being maybe a little chilly. But at the same time, you're going to be avoiding a lot of different uh, maladies like colds, flu and, and coronavirus. So in the end, I think it'll all work out. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Pam. I really appreciate it. Keep up the great work as always. And I look forward to having you on again soon. Thank you very much. You keep up the good work too. Great job. job. (laughs) Thank you. Did you know William Morris founded the Staten Island chapter of the NAACP in 1925? Thank you for listening to the Staten Island Advances from the scene. If you like what you've heard, please make sure to rate and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and visit SILive.com for the latest on all these stories and more. Thank you for supporting local journalism. What's new in podcasting? Here's what we love, courtesy of ACAST Recommends. Hey, ACAST listeners, you want to listen to another podcast as you're listening to this one? Hey, I ACAST guess? listeners, may we cut in? <laughs> it's like if you're eating at a restaurant, they're like, hey, I have some ideas for other foods you could eat. Hey. Podcast ads are terrible. What's the point of this? Babe, you need a new boyfriend. <laughs> I'm sure what you're listening to is great, but we do. We do a Dungeons & Dragons podcast called Dungeons & Daddies. It's about four dads from our world who are flung into a land of high fantasy and magic in a quest to rescue their lost sons. Fish out of water. It's rowdy. If you don't like d d Hey, we don't either, kinda. <laughs> In fact, you don't even need to know much about Dungeons and Dragons to get what's going no. on. So check it out. We're finishing up our first season now, so it's the perfect time to jump in. Check out our podcast. It's called Dungeons and Daddies. You can Google it. A-Cash, 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 A-Cash recommends. recommends.